Hey, we had an audio recording problem with our sermon Sunday. And I wanted to share it with you because I heard so many comments after the sermon. So here we go. Have you ever been a patient at a mental health facility? Not something we want to admit, but knowing many of you, you've been there. You've been gracious enough to invite me to visit you when you're admitted at a mental health facility. I've been to many facilities in many states, and this is always universally true. You know the first thing they do when you're admitted? The very first thing, even after the paper, even before the paperwork? They take this away. They know that for you to recover, you can't have this anymore. This is busy. This is distraction. This takes you away from what your focus needs to be. A mental health facility knows that for you to recover, you can't have this. For you to recover, for you to grow, for you to be healthy, you can't be busy. The church is much the same way. People came to church yesterday because they want to recover. They come to church because they want to grow. They come to church because life seems hopeless right now, and you'd like just a little bit of hope. But like the mental health facilities, so also the church, for you to grow, you have to admit, identify your enemy. You have to see what is it that keeps you from being your best. Who's your enemy? Who keeps you working to burnout stage? Who fills you with worry and stress? Who attaches fear? A fear that it, it's never going to get any better. I'm never going to be able to change. I just, I might as well give up. Can you identify the enemy that keeps you from growth? Jesus told us a story on Sunday to teach us our enemy. He told us a story for us to see what's really holding us back and what needs to change. It is a simple story, something you've seen and experienced many times in your life. A dinner. Jesus had dinner at a woman's home. A woman who is very much like you. Hard worker. Successful. Giving and caring. When I think about the people I'm blessed with in our church, there's a lot of them. I mean, if, if you think about yourself, wouldn't you say, you know, I am a hard worker. I, I am giving. I am caring. I, that's who I am and who I really want to be. What strikes me most about this woman, and maybe similar to you, is her hospitality. She opens up her home because she's a giving person. And in the story, she opens up her home for 13 guests. Can you imagine how much work that would be? To get food ready for 13 grown men and your brother and your sister and yourself. Martha is a great woman. She's hardworking. She's generous. She's successful. She has the, the means and the home to feed 16 people. I mean, think if you had 16 people at your home, think how many hours you would need to get everything ready. How much effort you would do to plan where everybody's going to sit and, and how the meal's going to be and who's going to be by whom. Think all of the time that would go into such a, a massive dinner party. When you read the scriptures, Jesus isn't invited over to homes very often for meal. Having 12 carry-on disciples, it kind of limits the seating arrangement. Martha's a hard worker. She's a generous woman. She's a giving woman. And she's ready to invite so many to her home. In the story, Martha's got work to do. She's got feet to wash. She's got a table to set. She's got a floor to sleep. She's got food to prepare. And Martha probably thinks like you do in this way, that she's got work to do 
and then she's got time for Jesus. That when I get my work done, when everything's ready, when everything's clean, when everything's prepared, then, then I've got time for Jesus. Do you think this way? Do you think that when you get your work done, when everything's ready, then Jesus, then a little time for Jesus? You ever say to yourself, you know, I, I like going to church and I'd like to go to church more. But I got so much to do. Sunday school would be good for me. I know I, I don't go as often as I should. But I've got so much to do. Reading my Bible at home, oh, it gives me comfort. Opening the app on my phone that I haven't opened in a while, and that gives me direction and guidance, but, but I've got so much to do. Are you, you, you hardworking, you generous, you caring Christian, do you have the same enemy as Martha? That you order your life, work first, Jesus second. There's an easy way to figure it out. Look at how you spend your time. Evaluate how you spend your weekends, how you order your evenings, how you plan out your day. Does Jesus come first? Or second. I think it's true for many of us, and especially myself, that when we look at our life, work comes first. When we look at our schedule and our calendar, I, I'd like some more time for Jesus, but I got to do this. I got to take the kids here. I got to get this prepared. Oh, yeah, I should go to the dentist. There's all these things we think we have to do. Is this your enemy? That you put work? ahead of Jesus. A couple of years ago, a honest woman admitted something to me. She had been pretty regular in coming to church and then kind of fell off for maybe five or six weeks in a row. And I sat down with her and I asked her, I said, what's wrong? Like you used to be coming now. Is there something, can I help with something? Is there something going on? She looked at me and with full honesty said, Pastor, you, you really want to know why I'm not coming to church? I do. Laundry. I do my laundry on Sunday morning. She wasn't arrogant. She wasn't boastful. You, you could see the sadness that she really processed it in her brain. I do laundry instead of Jesus. I think a lot of us think like her. And that's a great irony. I mean, we as Americans, we know we do too much. We know we should slow down. And yet we don't. I asked you in the beginning of the sermon, if you could identify your enemy, if you could see what it is that drives you to burnout, which brings so much problems. Do, do you see the enemy now? I mean, I see my enemy. Do, do you see yours? Our enemy is not work. It's not laundry. Laundry's good. Get it done. Our enemy is the order that we put work more important than Jesus. Because it's often true. If you put Jesus second in your life, often he just comes out to be last. So Jesus, Jesus wants to be first. And Jesus is the opposite of work. He is the antithesis of work. Jesus is rest. Rest that you need. In worship, you don't work. In worship on Sunday morning, you sit in these nice padded pews and you rest. You sing in his promises. You rest in his glory. You exult in prayer. In Sunday school, you don't work. You rest. You rest in community and in guidance, in thinking about your life in a different way and growing. And when you open your Bible or you open the app at home, your personal devotions, you don't work. 
you rest. You rest in his wisdom. You rest in his love. You rest in his guidance. See, Jesus wants you to slow down. He wants you to reorder life and his promises and his care. But, but often we're too busy being Martha. Often we don't listen. We're too busy. We're too bullheaded. We keep thinking that with the problems in our life, if I just work harder, it'll be better. We're already stressed enough. We're already bitter and exhausted enough. We have all these worries and fears. Our society is so negative today, and yet we foolishly think, I'll fix it. I'll do more. In our stress, in our bitterness, in our hurt, in our worries and fears, and we think we're going to fix ourselves? How foolish. Yeah, that's the way we think. That, that more hours, more effort, more social media, more, more stuff for the kids. We work ourselves to death and then wonder why we're not happy. Like Martha in the story, we get upset and worried about many things. Angry that people don't help us. Here's the enemy. The enemy is that we have the wrong order to life. This wrong order, it stunts recovery. It robs us of hope. It puts us back in bad places where we rely on ourselves and blame others. Fellow Marthas, listen to God's gentle call in the gospel. His loving words to Martha. Martha. You can, you can put your name in there. He's speaking to you. Keith, Keith, Rachel, Rachel, Joshua, Joshua, whatever your name is. This gentle gospel double name is your Savior saying, stop. You don't have to fix all your problems. You are not the cure to all of life's ills. Happiness is not found with laundry folded or bills paid, there's always going to be more laundry. There's always going to be more bills. We have found the enemy, and it's not them. We have found the enemy, and he is us. Forgive us, Lord, for living life in the wrong order. Forgive us, Lord, for working too much. Forgive us, Lord, that so often we blame others and get angry at others when we are the problem. Forgive us, Lord, for our sin. On Sunday morning, we sang this comforting hymn, In Christ Alone. You see, not work, but, but Jesus. He is the one thing needed. Christ took on flesh, the fullness of God and helpless being. We sang that on him every sin of ours was laid. Through whose death you now have eternal life. By whose power you now stand. Jesus came to Martha's house because he loves misguided sinners. He calls you to stop working so much. He calls you to rest. Trust. And sit at his feet, listening to the promises of your Savior. Your Savior's love for you is boundless. So rest. Rest in the truth that God has heard your confession. He has forgiven you your sins. And he loves you more than anyone else. Just think of it. Think how much God's got to love you to forgive you of the same sins every day. Every day you ask for it. Every day he gives it. He never gets exhausted. He never gets irritated. This is how much he loves you. To forgive you when you're doing the same thing again. Fully and freely forgives all your sins. Faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Rest in that. That's comforting. Rest also in this truth, as the hymn writer said, that our hope is found in him our foundation through the fiercest drought and storm. Right now you're going through a lot. And there's this temptation when life is overwhelming to think, I'm going to fix it. But learn today this truth. You can't fix it. You can't fix your family. You can't solve your boss. 
You can't remove hurt and pain for life. Thank God you can't fix it. You can't earn it. You can't make it. You can't achieve it. You see, you have a Savior who knows you can't do it. You have a Savior who has watched you since the moment of your conception, who's seen your first tumble, who's seen your first tear, who sees just how often every day you exhaust yourself thinking, I'm going to be able to do it. He knows you. He knows how you struggle thinking that you have to fix life and God doesn't want burnout for you. No, only one thing is needed. And that's not laundry. And that's not a paycheck. And that's not picking up toys or picking up your life. Leave that for another day. Sit at Jesus' feet. It is not work first, then Jesus. It is Jesus first. And then everything else. Friends, rest in Jesus. Rest with him on Sunday morning. You need his grace. Rest with him in Sunday school. You need the guidance and the community. Rest with him in your daily devotions. You need him more than you can probably even comprehend. Grab a devotional book. We have them for free in our fellowship hall. Or download the Wells app. Put down that phone at night. All it does is busy and distraction. The mental health people are right. That's not good for you. Instead, Give yourself grace. Let yourself rest. Change the order of your life each day, even how hard that is to do. Jesus first. Work 